Hello, my name is Noel Kingsbury, and with my colleague Annie Gelfoyle, I run Garden Masterclass. Now, Annie and I started Garden Masterclass uh, six years ago to put on live educational events uh, in the British Isles. Uh, but with um, COVID, uh, the lockdown in April 2020, uh, we started doing a public service broadcast. Uh, and then we've settled down to running both live events, uh, but also with a big online content. So we do this Thursday Garden Chat once a week on a Thursday evening, six o'clock um, Western European time. And those recordings then go up on to uh, YouTube. Now, we also do webinars. We have a webinar season that runs through from September to May. We get leading experts globally uh, from the garden and landscape world to talk about their specialism. And of course, that's an opportunity uh, to ask them questions. Most of those webinars are recorded and are then available uh, through Vimeo from our website. Uh, we also put on courses. Uh, there's a course on naturalistic planting design, for example, which I do with uh, Professor Nigel Dunnett of the University of Sheffield in, in Northern England. Uh, and uh, we sometimes get involved in organizing conferences. Uh, we do all sorts of things that are aimed at encouraging quality planting, quality gardening, uh, knowledge about plants and botany, and plant science, and uh, we hope you'll you'll join us. Uh, we have a membership scheme which gives you discounts on our webinars and live events and various other goodies. Uh, and but also you can just sign up for our monthly email newsletter uh, to keep in touch with what we're doing. We believe and we've been told by many people that what we do is unique. It's unique in the range and quality of people we talk to and our global reach and our diversity. Uh, so I uh, hope you enjoy this particular episode and uh, do come back for more. You are. Um, we've got um, Noel is actually in the same country as me at the moment, which is very unusual. Um, he sat on a park bench with three mobile phones. I think he might be get a, might get arrested. So if he if he suddenly disappears, he has been um, he's been he's been mistaken for as a drug dealer. Um, so um yeah so it's it's midsummer isn't it when well, it's gone midsummer we're, we're pretty busy uh with our heads down uh, working on um webinar program for the autumn and winter which we should be rolling out um in a month or so's time and also um coming up we have our uh, two-day uh symposium or conference at chatsworth which um tickets are going quite fast so if you're interested in that please do have a look on the diary pages we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers um it's a it's a two-day event with a, we were showing the film wild side on the first evening um it's in the magnificent setting of of Chatsworth which is always wonderful and so um, just have a look on the diary pages so um Noel shall I hand over to you to introduce hand over to me yes yes Lovely. so uh thank you Annie thank you uh, so any of us who know anything about uh American garden history will know about Mount Auburn um the first um landscaped cemetery in the United States, probably in North America. Um, now, Annie and I are both feeling rather guilty because we've both been to Boston a few times, but neither of us have ever been to Mount Auburn. Now, I don't know what Annie's excuses are, but I'm going to blame the weather because I always seem to go to Boston <laughs> in the middle of the winter. Um, and uh, several times I've trudged around the Arnold Arboretum um, in very cold, snowy, icy conditions. Uh, always ending up in the nice cosy library, which is a truly wonderful library. Um, and otherwise, uh, my Bostonian experiences tended to be rather, rather heavily indoors. Um, so that's my reason for never having a, a explored this, uh, this, this uh, very important uh, location. Now, it's uh, getting into the headlines a little bit because uh, Pete Aldolf um, and his Dutch colleague Tom de Witt have been working uh, on a garden there, and uh, that's one of the things I hope we're going to be hearing about this evening. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Mount Auburn's Head of Horticulture, Dennis Collins, uh, who's going to tell us about, about Mount Auburn, its biodiversity, and about the um, upcoming Aldolf Garden. So thank you very much for, for joining us. 
Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I really like the idea of this program that you're running. And I, I can imagine that during the pandemic, it was a bit of a lifeline for, for all of us who were um, <laughs> sheltering in place, as it were. Um, so cheers for that. Also, I, I'm aware that most of you have probably not been here, like just like Noel and Annie have not, and that's okay. But you, you should try someday. It's uh, I think worth visiting, and uh, hopefully after today you'll understand why. Um, a practical note: um, there are slides here where uh, I will list the botanical name of a plant, unfortunately not the common names. I hope that isn't a problem. If you really want to know a name, maybe you could raise your hand or ask and I can backtrack and, and fill that in. Um, and the one that we're looking at at the moment, of course, um, has no name attached to it. This is Amsonia hubrichtii, which um, really shines in the fall. It, it almost has no appeal for its flowers um, early in the spring, rather, I guess, around May. But when, uh, when the autumn comes, it turns a, an amazing gold color. Um, anyway, um, you're just looking at a bit of that. So I guess I should introduce this place, a little background first. We occupy 175 acres um, just on the outskirts of Boston, which is a major metropolitan area. And um, as for the history, well, we were founded by a group of, of, of people, essentially the Horticulture Society, which was itself just formed the year before. Uh, but in 1925, 18, excuse me, 1825, they started talking about this rather unusual idea. You, you might even say a strange idea to combine um, cemetery and, and horticulture. They had the idea that they could maybe change the way people felt about death. At the time, cemeteries were pretty grim and dark places and unhealthy, and nobody wanted to be in there and visit them. And this idea happened at a time when there were no places the public could go to experience horticulture. There were certainly horticulture on private estates, but the public was never um, invited, I suppose. Uh, there was no place uh, until Mount Arbor opened. And um, it worked. It was an instant success. Uh, and the model was replicated in most major cities along the eastern seaboard here, eventually leading to the American Parks Movement, which happened um, in the 1860s. The um, <laughs> Uh, in 1860, the 19-year-old Prince of Wales, the later King Edward VII, came to Mount Auburn uh, to do a very symbolic uh, tree planting ceremony. This was just prior to the beginning of the American Civil War. And I guess the idea was to show solidarity with the North. So they had this tree planting ceremony. And uh, if you read about it, 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 it described his visit and saying he wanted to see, uh, first he went to the number one tourist attraction in America, and then number two, which was Mount Auburn. And if you'd like the answer to a trivia question, the number one tourist attraction at that time was Niagara Falls. Today, uh, it's not. Um, so, Fast forward to the present day, um, and what we are, I, I hope, I guess you could still consider us a tourist attraction, though maybe not even in the top 100, but we are considered by some to be a horticultural treasure. Uh, some of our trees date from the time of the founding, so they would be, you know, 
200 years or so. Um, we have a wide range of different horticultural styles from you know, very formal and picturesque to very rustic and um, naturalistic. Um, By the way, our beech trees um, <clears throat> have a number of problems, which we're going to talk about at some point today. Um, but this one isn't here anymore. We we had before the current uh, crisis, which is something called beech leaf disease. There was an earlier one, which was the Phytophthora fungus, and uh, it always hit the trees that were between 120 and 150 years old. This particular one at the time was a magnificent specimen, and um, unfortunately, we took it down uh, three years ago. We manage the site the way most major botanic gardens are, are managed. We, um, we track the plant collections in a database. Uh, BG Base, which was designed for botanic gardens by uh, Kerry Walter, who's based now at RBG Edinburgh. Um, at the time, he worked at the Arnold Arboretum, um, but he, he built the program, which is, which is one of the best. Um, so as of just a sampling, uh, we have a, the range of horticultural styles, but we also have a lot of public uh, outreach. We, we welcome probably, I'm guessing maybe more than 250,000 visitors per year. The last time we counted was 1993, uh, at which point it was estimated to be 200,000. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was more than double that, but we're actually counting them again this year and we, we might have a better number going forward. We offer um, many uh, uh, formal educational programs, um, tours and lectures, and uh, lots of different groups, garden club groups and horticulture societies come here to visit um, all year round, <clears throat> all ages. And during the pandemic, by the way, <laughs> we, the visitation went through the roof. The, there were you know, three times the number of visitors uh, as before. We conduct science. We have a citizen science program that um, um, tracks phenology, which is, um, among other things, the uh, dates by which certain things happen. And in the plant world, that is essentially uh, when plants break buds, when they start to flower, when the flower is finishing. They're also tracking insect activity and so forth. Uh, the photo is actually <clears throat> not. He's looking at um, tadpoles in one of our in the vernal pool that we have on site. And we are a wildlife sanctuary. Um, we manage the site. We'll talk about this more, but we we do a lot actually to um, to make the site more hospitable to a lot of different wildlife, but. I have to say, especially the birds, um, we happen to be a major stop on the migration northward in the spring for literally hundreds of species of birds. And um, you now they may only stay here for a, a week or two, but it's, uh, it's an important stop for them to um, feed and rest and uh, you know, having flown up quite a long ways from the south. We are also uh, accredited as an arboretum. I don't know if you've heard of ARBNET. It's a program started by the Morton Arboretum. It's an international organization. And to, to be awarded accreditation, you have to show a, a few things. You have to show that you are doing it the right way. You keep track of your things, you know, and you have a public um, outreach effort, um, scientific research, et cetera. That tree, uh, it looks like something out of the Dr. Seuss book. Um, 
That's actually a 70 year old uh, dwarf weeping form of uh, the pagoda tree, which um, is quite a nice specimen, I think. Uh, and you'll know, of course, Acer palmetto. <clears throat> We're also one of the uh, founding members of a national uh, germplasm conservation program. Uh, we became one of the, well, at the time, I think 15 gardens holding the collection for the genus Quercus. Um, our oak collection, um, this is an older slide from the time when, when we joined, uh, but from 2012, we actually have more than those numbers show, but the collection was um, reasonably large and broad enough, 22 species, to, um, to be worthwhile. Um, but some of the trees uh, actually are the, the 22 or so that we uh, have a, a determined to predate of the founding of Mount Arbor. So they're very old and they're remnants of an existing oak forest that was on site prior to the founding. So when we talk about um, biodiversification, uh, I want to frame it in the context of some of the horticultural initiatives that we're following, have been following. And all of these really, for different reasons, um, want to have biodiversity and sustainability emphasized going forward. This was done in uh, 2021, we finished it. Um, the collections numbers, as you see on the screen, are a little bit up. We're going to look at them later, but uh, they're a little bit higher than those numbers. But the initiatives down at the bottom here, conifer diversification, underground tombs, curb and fence lots, um, test the warmer hardiness zone plants that historically have not done particularly well here. Um, and include things that flower later in the spring and during the summer for reasons that we'll talk about. And also practice land, historic landscape preservation um, and ecologically centered wildlife habitat enhancement. The reason for the conifer diversification is that we started to get um, an outbreak of an insect that that um, is really <laughs> devastating to hemlock uh, in its natural environment. Um, it came, I think, in 1995, and at the time we had uh, 370 uh, Suga canadensis. Um, most other Suga is also susceptible to it. Um, there's only one newly described species that was uh, introduced from Korea maybe five years ago, and it seems to show good resistance. But all of the others, the uh, four that you would find in this country and uh, several Asian species as well, all seem to be uh, susceptible. I believe the uh, Adelgid came over here from Asia. Um, and once it got in, it moved steadily northward. We were just on the edge of its uh, cold limitation. So if, if we had been a little further north, we would have maybe been spared. But at the time, we thought our conifer collection is much too vulnerable. Between the hemlocks and the native white pine, uh, which we also had quite a lot of, and that's a problem because when you grow the pine in, in the open, it tends to get very large horizontal lower limbs. Um, it, when you grow it in the forest, it's much more upright and narrow. Um, and the forest setting provides lots of strength against wind and storms. But when you grow them in the open, if you see a typical winter storm where you have snow and ice on those lower limbs, they break off very easily. And when they do, they almost always land on some other tree or plant or, or monumental. So, so 
we began um, systematically um, and deliberately finding things that would um, not replace hemlocks, but at least make up for the losses. We've reduced our collection of hemlocks by something like uh, 60%. Um, and we basically chose the ones that we felt we could maintain reasonably using the non-toxic horticultural oil applications. Um, we are virtually pesticide free when it comes to spraying. We, we, don't, we don't do any on the trees anymore. We do micro injections when necessary, if you mean systemic. <clears throat> but um, I wouldn't say we're 100% organic, but we certainly have come a long way from, from the old days. These happen to be three uh, firs that, that uh, are here and do well, but we've only got a few represented in the collections. And <clears throat> so part of the effort is to acquire things like that. And um, frankly, a lot of the uh, species of fir and spruce that we're targeting for this program are only available to us if we get it from seed. <clears throat> and that means uh, they're going to stay in the nursery for at least five years and probably more realistically, 10 years. Another initiative is um, to replace turf that was typically growing on top of 640 um, lots, burial lots that had these uh, underground tombs or, or hillside tombs, if you will, which uh, because of, uh, uh, well, a few different reasons, safety being number one, we didn't want our mowing equipment to drive across the tops of these things. They often only had a vaulted brick roof um, and maybe a foot of soil on top of that. And, and some of them have failed, not, not a lot, but it has happened. And we, at one point long ago, decided we wouldn't mow, we wouldn't send the equipment or vehicles on the tops of these things. So, um, it's much safer that way. By the way, it also allows for um, many, many better horticultural alternatives to simply having turf inside of this. Um, typical iron fencing or the granite curbing type lots, which are very common. We we have, I think I saw, in the, I think I said in the last slide, 640 of these, and we're only about 40% of the way through. And Pace is slow. We do, I would say, six to eight of these per year. Um, but uh, it's already starting to be noticeable, I think. Uh, this particular one is a native, uh, I guess, a woodland species, Omphilodes. Um, does really well, and uh, uh, it flowers during May. Um, I'm not sure if you have that in the UK yet or not, but uh, it's a good one. Once it gets established, which maybe only takes a full year, year and a half, um, <clears throat> it's very good at keeping the weeds out. So worth trying. A couple of different geraniums in this case, another one of those iron fence logs. And here is the, the kind of granite curbing that I mentioned it was much more common than the fences. And I remember when, when I first started here in 1990, uh, somebody's job was to drive around with a little golf cart, lift a lawnmower out of it, bring it up the steps, start it up, run it for 30 seconds, and then pack it away and go to the next one over and over and over. So it was a big maintenance issue. Um, and as I said before, um, I, it is, doing a really good job of breaking up the homogeneity of the ground layer, which back in the 90s when I came was essentially grass. There was an obsession with um, manicured turf. So in, I mentioned the earlier um, plantings uh, uh, tended to use a single block planting, uh, which, which is good. I mean, 
both are effective too. And more recently, um, mixing uh, and doing a blend of different plants, and especially in the Victorian period zone, which uh, we have a number of these lots in. Um, the list of things has been shaped by trial and error. We have tested a lot of different things. I think there's something like 70, 70 uh, taxa on the list right now. This is a little sampling of what it is. Um, we want to keep testing. We What we don't want to do is end up relying on um, a small number of really reliable solutions. Um, in the early days, they, because it was so easy to propagate from cuttings, we were doing so many plantings with um, heterohelix, um, Pachysandra terminalis, um, Vinca minor, and, um, and, and a Euonymus radicans, which uh, it, it turns out was a disaster because even though it was a dwarf form, uh, with small foliage and a low growing habit, it had a, a tendency to revert to its normal genetics and it became a sprawling thug uh, within a few years. So <clears throat> you don't want to use that one so much. Another initiative was, um, I mentioned earlier, uh, trying to get more plants that are adapted to warmer temperature zones. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm not so good with the UK uh, hardiness zone and temperature conversion, but so and I had to look at it. So forgive me if I refer to my notes here. Um, what we're looking to do is add things for the USDA hardiness zone six and seven. And that roughly translates to the RHS zone six with minimum low temperatures of minus 20 Celsius or minus five Fahrenheit over here. We were officially reclassified zone to zone six 10 years ago after being considered zone five for as long as they had the hardiness zone rating system. And obviously climate change is causing this uh, warming trend. Even if some erratic weather events uh, <clears throat> fall well beyond the boundaries of these zones. Uh, as an example, we had a day last February when the temperatures were down as low as minus 11 Fahrenheit, minus 24 Celsius. Despite such events, we, we know we have to keep trying plants um, because if no changes are made in the CO2 emissions, um, uh, they project that Boston will likely be um, USDA zone eight by then, which is uh, minimum temperature of minus nine Celsius. We will essentially have the climate of Maryland, which is uh, close to Washington DC, midway down the coast. And so we we have been planting. We we are using things which traditionally were very borderline hardy and uh, are happy with the results so far. We may lose something. If we're going to lose something, it's generally uh, you know before it's fully established. Um, and some of that is, to be honest, just luck. If you get a mild winter <clears throat> and a plant has a full year of establishment time, it will often make it through much harsher uh, winters in the future, uh, as long as it has that early chance to grow. Now, another curious thing is that um, Araucaria, the monkey puzzle tree, um, has never been hardy in Boston. And we got one, it was intended to be part of a seasonal display of tropical and semi-tropical plants. Um, we thought we would just bring it into the greenhouse for the winter and bring it back out the following year. But uh, we decided to plant it in the ground. And this was planted, I think in September um, a year ago. And you can see from the left, the photo, um, it had, uh, um, some snow cover, but that day that I told you about when the temperatures reached 
uh, minus 11 Fahrenheit, minus 24 Celsius. This was outside and it did not have that snow cover. So uh, I fully expected it to be, uh, you know, toast. Uh, but the fact is, it came back in the spring. It ha you see some brown foliage uh, that you know was uh, if that's all it's going to do on one of the coldest uh, snaps we ever had. Then that's that's to me, it's quite amazing. <clears throat> it's putting on new growth, and now it doesn't mean that this happens to be a miracle. I just think that the the true hardiness rating of this plant wasn't known and yeah, i think it was considered zone seven or eight and here we are um in zone six with a winter temperature that was um at least you know at least zone five if not zone four so i guess the moral of the story is it's worth trying even if the odds are against it Another initiative was to add more later flowering plants to the collections. And although this might seem like a purely horticultural motivation, um, it wasn't. It was basically um, a precaution to address the phenomenon whereby plants are flowering much earlier in the year than they used to. We have good records locally that go back to uh, Henry David Thoreau writing in the, in the 19th century of when things were starting to flower. He kept meticulous records. We also have a uh, really good uh, herbarium uh, in Cambridge. It's the Arnold Arboretum and Harvard University maintain uh, specimens from that go back for well over 100 years. And from those herbarium sheets, you can actually see the date when it was collected and therefore when it was in flower. And we've learned that things are flowering, in some cases a month earlier than they were um, back then. So the concern is that bird migration is not triggered by temperature, it's triggered by day length. And when the birds arrive here after their long flight up the coast, what they're really looking to do is feed on the insects that are attracted to the flowers. And if 50 years from now they're coming and nothing, everything has already finished flowering, then it might be a bit of a disaster. So um, that was the genesis of this initiative. And uh, we've been doing it now for a number of years. And it's simply a matter of being mindful. If, if we have options, and we know we want to plant a tree, a shrub, a large shrub, or whatever it may be. We can simply refer to a list of targets and judge if you know we might be able to use something that flowers later in the spring, June, for instance, or during the summer in July. And, uh, these are two very good ones. We've got a lot of this uh, bottle brush buckeye on the left and um, the native cotinus on the right. Um, Albizia has a, a checkered past with us. Um, when Mount Auburn was founded in 1831, I know they were uh, receiving seeds sent to them from Turkey. This is a plant that has a really wide distribution across Asia, uh, from the Southwest all the way up as far North as Korea. And it was only when Ernest Wilson collected the plant in Korea that they found a, a, a strain um, hardy enough to grow up here. We have um, a really good specimen, our oldest one is from, uh, it was planted in 1939. Um, and we have been adding more since, but great summer flowering plant. I hope you've all seen that one before. The chlorodendron is a bit of a, it can be a bit of a thug. You need to give it space, um, but it's it's quite an interesting plant. So in landscape preservation terms, uh, it, this can mean different things depending on <clears throat> who and where, um, what it is trying to preserve. At Mount Arbor, we never had an original landscape design. 
to follow and to preserve the way you might find with a Frederick Law Olmsted project like Central Park in New York. Instead, we have a landscape that was shaped by generations of horticulturists. We've had a variety of landscape architects who worked here and, and left an imprint. Um, over the past 30 years, we have uh, interpreted our role as stewards, I guess, um, to include preserving the range of different landscapes and horticultural styles that have shifted and evolved over the last 190 years. <clears throat> and these include a rural cemetery, uh, the Victorian style, the, um, the in, even the 20th century lawn landscape style, um, and all kinds of formal and semi-formal landscapes as well. This is maybe what you might have seen a lot of back in the 19th century. We have a woodland, uh, four and a half acres, where the, we have only restricted ourselves to native New England species. We have, uh, you know, a, a semi-formalized garden pastel. Um, this one used the redbud, Circus uh, canadensis as well as, a, you can't see them now, but a, a half a dozen or six or eight birch trees. <clears throat> a formal elements, which with horticultural richness. Um, the formality of uh, structures where we have gardens that in this case, there's a, a, a fountain uh, and um, symmetrically aligned uh, beds contained within uh, above walls surrounding it. And I'm using my cursor now as a, as a pointer, but um, you know, working with the structure, we 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 happen to have a lot of built structure here, as well as good topography. We, Mount Auburn was chosen in 1831 because it had not been clear cut for agriculture the way most of the land around Boston was. It was hilly and 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 that that's why there was a, a, an established oak forest on site uh, of which we've got some remnants. But uh, topography is an excellent way to uh, practice horticulture and be, and be able to show off plants and different layers, visual layers in the landscape. But working with the built landscape as well, monuments, sculpture, walls and steps, uh, all of that works for, um, for bringing horticulture into the picture. And at the other end of the scale, of course, the completely naturalistic and uncomplicated style that might have been typical of most of Mount Auburn back in the 19th century. I like this. I think that, you know, the uncomplicated nature of that um, really kind of highlights the beauty of the marble, the antique marble monuments that you see here. Um, but in any case, we've always had the sort of complementary and at times antagonistic relationship between horticulture and uh, monuments and infrastructure. But by and large, it works and you know it, it can produce some interesting results. And moving forward, we uh, have been doing um, as much as possible alternatives to the mode formal manicured lawn uh, that that was so typical of Mount Auburn and a lot of the you know eastern United States um, through much of the 20th century. We have been doing meadows um, for a while. We are still learning and each time we do one we learn something more <clears throat> not just about which plants will work here but what it takes to get them established. And sometimes it's a very quick process and sometimes it's very long. One of my favorite plants, the Amorpha canescens shown on the right in the foreground, takes forever to get 
that size. This this is like 10 years after it was planted, but it would began as a as a tiny little thing. And it seemed to only put on an inch or so of growth a year until, you know, after three or four or five years go, went by. <clears throat> and then it finally uh, gets to show what it's what it's capable of. Beautiful plant. In the early uh, to mid 90s, we did try uh, an experiment where uh, we we overseeded some sections of the historic core of Mount Auburn. Uh, by the way, in the 1990s, digital photography was just a dream. And I'm sorry, the quality of this slide is because it was literally a slide that was scanned. Um, fortunately, it's the only one that I use. But back then, the public wasn't ready for it. Uh, when we explained what we were doing, there's a sign here, it says turf experiment in progress. People say, okay, I get what you're doing, but could you mow the grass on our lot? And of course it undermined the entire uh, experiment. So um, we shelved it. We finally uh, came back to it. And uh, and wouldn't you know it, the, the public perceptions, the attitudes about <clears throat> naturalistic turf or meadows or alternatives to lawns have changed a lot and um you know more and more people realize the ecological benefits of doing this not just because of the high carbon footprint of mowing operations and uh, all that comes with maintaining perfect perfectly manicured turf but the benefits to uh, pollinators and wildlife um, are enormous um, so we've had success recently um, in this particular one. Uh, it was a fescue dominant um, planting, uh, creeping red and chewing fescues. Um, I am very fond of this. I'd be happy if we could pull that off all over the place. Um, and we don't just, of course, do uh, grass or sedge plantings. We we like uh, having a forb component. And in fact, uh, sometimes that is as simple as allowing things, spontaneous growth, uh, to occur in an otherwise uh, naturalistic turf area. So in this case, it's a hawkweed, which we didn't plant. It, it, was, it was in the seed bank, and it came up on its own and has spread by not mowing, we discovered it was there, but but for probably been there for decades, but by mowing, you would never notice it. In other cases, we would use the forbs uh, in large numbers and not bother with grass. We, in this case, got the Black Eyed Susan, Rudbeckia um, growing uh, on its own. In this uh, photo, a uh, mix of grasses, I believe it was um, uh, Budalua and fescue, possibly some um, um, Sporambolus as well. But the, the forbs, um, I think, are worth noting because Allium cernuum, the nodding onion, uh, is a very attractive plant. I, I'm afraid because I took this looking toward the sun, you can't catch the color, but they're actually quite um, quite, quite good plants up close. Uh, you don't need to see them from a distance. Behind them, uh, also faded by the, the light conditions, uh, Scutellaria, um, which is, is very happy in this particular spot. Uh, we have a mix of things in this meadow. Um, this is uh, uh, planted um, in our highest elevation, I suppose what is considered Mount Auburn, although we never really call it that. Uh, but it's, um, it's where we had uh, constructed an observation tower um, in the 19th centuries. Um, and you can look out from the top over there and see the entire city. Um, very popular destination. It had uh, a mowed turf all around it. It's about an acre uh, um, altogether. And we converted this to uh, a meadow 
um, back in 2006. So this one has been around for a while. Um, and it has really settled in, and we're very happy with the progress it made. Uh, an alternative, especially because it was in a shaded location, uh, was a meadow with using sedge instead of grass. Um, and in this case, it was Carrick's Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania sedge, a very attractive alternative to grass, but a very expensive one to use it on large scale because the seed viability rate is less than 50%, um, and it's hard to find, and it's, even the seed is expensive, but um, we grew this, we did this by buying 500 and cutting them in half every year for five years until we had something like, I don't know, eight, six or 8,000. You know, if you have the time, you can do that. But all, there are other sedges too, which uh, are much more reliable for the seed. Um, in shady spots, you could also use ground covers like sweet woodruff, um, the gallium, um, which we've done here. Now, beyond turf alternatives and meadows, uh, we do have other planting projects and initiatives that are focused on wildlife habitat vegetation and the food and cover resources that they provide for not just the birds, but um, insects as well, and, um, salamanders, amphibians, small mammals, um, particularly on our water bodies. Now, here's one of the rock stars of Mount Auburn. This is a resident uh, great horned owl. Um, several years ago, uh, they had babies, and uh, it was such a media circus that we had to cordon off an area, uh, like a 100-foot buffer zone, uh, beyond which people with their cameras couldn't go until the, uh, the babies matured. Um, so, and the birds, um, you know, we have residents like the owl uh, and others too. A lot of the birds just stop on their way flying north, but we've got, um, you know, many dozens of species that that uh, stick around year year round um, and make themselves at home. In 2015, we did a wildlife action plan. And it was the result of hosting a three-day workshop here <clears throat> where we invited uh, various specialists in ecology, in ornithology, and hydrology, et cetera. Um, I forget what the, this, there's a specialist who does amphibians. I've forgotten the name. Nevertheless, um, this team, the dream team, we call them, uh, got together, sat down for three days, and all of them were blown away because it was their first chance to interact with colleagues from a totally different um, specialization. And um, the synergy of that group produced a lot of good ideas. We, we convened it as a way to ask uh, them to assess the work we had done up to that point and to see what we might be able to do better going forward. Um, and one of the one of the, the themes, I guess, that came out was that working with our four water bodies was uh, very important and um, for the benefit of not just fish and amphibians, but a lot, a lot of different species and including you know improving the water quality itself we we used to have um, major algae blooms in summer during the hot months um, we we noted that in those years you would see a lot of fish die off and um, uh, you know it, it made a sort of sickly looking green surface uh, covering the pond so 
we were doing things like adding aeration just to the right here on this image. You can see one of those uh, going in the pond, um, this particular one. But, but along the shoreline, it's not just a planting, uh, one of the many that we did using aquatic species and emergent zone species, but we actually built what we call the biofiltration shelf. And its purpose was, uh, well, here you're seeing them uh, load up uh, the sod, if you will. Um, aquatic plant specialists can grow the appropriate plants in water in a mesh um, matrix that can be moved into place and then staked in the ground. Um, this, you know, is maybe it covers 20 feet into the pond from the shore. And um, the purpose is to provide a way to filter stormwater that enters the pond through our underground pipe system. The system that drains all of our roads, we, we have more than 10 miles of roads on the site and lots of old uh, catch basins and you know iron uh, water pipes that run underneath the roads, eventually ending up in places like this pond. So, one of the reasons we get the algae outbreaks um, is because of the phosphorus loading that comes from that stormwater runoff. And by doing the biofiltration shelf, you allow some of that sediment to, <clears throat> to uh, be blocked before it enters the main section of the pond. In another one, uh, this is a vernal pool. We were doing plantings in order to provide protection uh, resources cover vegetation for um, reintroducing four different species of frogs and toads. Uh, and that started in 2010. This one is the American toad, but we think they, they were here, um, but disappeared probably 50 years ago or more. And I hate to say it, but it was probably due to uh, the widespread use of pesticides in the 1950s and into the 60s. Um, this is the pond at, at, at a few years back. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the vernal pool. <clears throat> this is also the habitat where a rare uh, spotted salamander species is uh, living and depending upon uh, for um, all of its life cycle um, and needs. So um, that sort of targeted habitat improvement enhancement um, can be seen in other places too. Where a butterfly garden, for instance, on a different pond. Um, <clears throat> And uh, that was very successful as well. So all of these reasons for um, expanding biodiversity, um, that gives you, I guess, a sense for why we're doing it. But as for what we've done, um, here's a look at the collections at the moment. This is the most recent uh, analysis that we did. Almost just a little short of 20,000 plants or mass plantings. When, when we count um, a group of shrubs or a wide you know, mass planting of herbaceous something, it, can, it counts as one. So there are almost 20,000, both either individuals or masses. And with a total of almost 2,500 taxa. If, if you don't know what taxa is, I apologize because I've used it a few times already without identifying, without defining it. A taxon is simply a unit um, in a classification system in, in a taxonomic um, framing of any group, you know, depending on the subject, it could be insects or in this case, it's plants. So, Taxa is simply a plural for a taxon. And so you could say we've got almost 2,500 different types of plants here. And the breakdown with trees, uh, you know, 4,600 um, shrubs and dwarf trees, another 6,200, et cetera, ground covers. Again, these are masses, not individuals. 
And then we are, we're able to do a more focused breakdown if we wanted to look at the shade trees and which are the dominant um, players on the grounds here. The native sugar maple is the most at the moment, <clears throat> and one of the oaks is second. Um, Norway maple is, <laughs> I don't know if you'd be amused to hear it or not, but here in, the, in, in, in New England, in Massachusetts, it's uh, prohibited for sale. Um, it's, it's, it's listed on the, on the uh, invasive plant species list. And, uh, and yet we still have a hundred. We, we, you know, we were planting a lot of this, particularly in the 1930s. It was considered, uh, you know, the, the great new urban tree. Um, but it has the ability to produce thousands and thousands of offspring. I once learned that in the reason it was not a problem when I was in Scotland, I, I found this out. When it flowers over there, there were only roughly, I don't know, three or five insects that might be involved in pollinating it active at that time. But here, when it when it starts to flower, there are more than 50. So just that a greater number of pollinators working uh, has created a situation where we, we can no longer use the tree. It's very difficult to grow things beneath it. It has a sort of phytochemistry that inhibits some plants from growing. Um, there are the conifers again. Uh, the eastern white pine is now the, the most dominant one. Uh, the Suga canadensis had been, but as we uh, discussed earlier, um, we've been reducing that collection considerably. And um, hopefully, you know, a lot of other um, conifer taxa will start to rise to the top of that list as time goes by. And with the ornamental trees, we've got a sort of iconic dogwood collection, um, which uh, has been around for more than a century. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a dramatic one. They're scattered throughout the grounds. They're not all in one place. And when they flower in the spring, it's, it's, uh, it's nice because you're never far enough away that you can't see at least one. But here's the thing, the, the, the thing that I'm the most proud of and um, the thing that kind of gets uh, the perspective of this whole biodiversification effort, in the last 10 years, we've increased the diversity by 35% and over 20 years, 44%. Probably this has as much to do with um, <clears throat> the limitations of the collections as they were 20 years ago. Uh, but we have been aggressively and actively trying to do this, and, and it just it's nice to know that it has made a difference. Um, um, the last, the most recent large-scale landscape renovation project um, was done. Um, I finished last year. It was um, along a 2,000-foot um, geological Esker, which is simply a, a formation that is a ridge. It's got a flat top and it's steep sides sloping down. <clears throat> and this one, you know, uh, 2,000 feet is pretty long. There's a, it's a popular spot to walk, but over time it had been neglected and the invasive species, including the Norway maples, but also the usual culprits around here anyway, the, the burning bush euonymus, the um, honeysuckle, the um, barberry, and black swallowwort, they were all running rampant on the slope. So year one was essentially doing invasives removal. Uh, by the way, this, this came out of that wildlife habitat action plan where we were deliberately trying to link up um, all of the projects that had been done, um, you know, essentially forming a core of wildlife habitat intensive areas. Uh, and this was kind of linking something, the center group over toward the two ponds in the northeast corner. So, as I said, phase one was to essentially remove a lot of trees, although we did also plant. Um, and phase two was a continuation of that planting on the slopes. 
we left phase three, the top flat part of the bridge uh, for just last year and essentially um, decided to replace the path. It was too small. Our little utility vehicles were always driving on it with one wheel on the pavement and one wheel off. So both sides of the path were severely compacted. We, we found a, a good stone permeable paving mix that has performed really well. And we replaced the path. And instead of going back to turf, to mowed grass, we decided to go with a plan to do a sedge and wildflower meadow led by uh, Larry Weiner, who's a friend of mine, a, a, a meadows specialist who works out of Philadelphia. Um, and uh, they looked at the ridge, came up with these various zones where based on um, sunlight and shade and, and uh, other factors, um, there would be some changes. So the plant list is not continuous throughout, but in one zone, for instance, the, the North Ridge entry, you have one group, one plant list. Uh, and as you move, as you progress along the length of the ridge, you shift into others. And this particular one had an emphasis on the fine textured sedges, uh, Carex pensylvanica, which I showed you earlier in a different place. But other sedges like that would be Carex rosea, and Carex albicans, that, that sort of thing, um, in a different mix of forms as you move from one section to another. Um, I'm using Larry's photos here because I mentioned it went in last summer, and this is what it was like. We planted this in August, and it's, it's not spectacular, but you can see um, this section, the north section, was done using plugs. And, um, and so at least you can see the plants and what, what they are and what they will be. But the whole southern section was done by seed. You know, careful blend uh, and broadcast installation. So when spring came, uh, what we we were a little underwhelmed. We actually had a dramatic display of oxalis, um, <clears throat> which obscured all of the the new seedlings that were coming up. It wasn't until we started to clear that that we could at least confirm they were in there. They were small, but they were still growing. Uh, and we also took the chance to add more plugs this past spring. So it'll be a while until that becomes um, impressive. I would think maybe by next summer, I hope anyway. So um, now you know the reasons anyway for expanding biodiversity. It works on different levels, uh, both ecological um, and horticultural. Uh, it's one of our challenges. It's not the only one. Um, and this is now out of order. This was just one more slide from Larry's project. But the challenges are <clears throat> essentially erratic weather events. As you know, from this past summer, I, I think most of Europe had a very dramatic heat wave. And um, parts of the U.S. have also had it. And we, on the other hand, have had an enormous amount of rain this summer through June and July, an absurd amount of rain. I, I would guess 10 to 20 inches above normal. I, I don't know for sure. I should have looked at it. We don't get as much snow in the winter as we used to, but, um, but we can. And, and just a couple of years ago, we had this one. It was a storm that dumped almost three feet of snow. Uh, but snow is not a bad thing in, in some sense. It's a really good insulator for plants uh, to withstand extreme cold temperatures. Also, it doesn't always look bad. <laughs> now, this is when it's beginning to melt. This is early spring, and it just happens to be, you know, you can see the fog forming from the melting snow. Um, but it's it's attractive. I, I I have to say, you know, we complain about snow here mostly because we have to clear it and shovel it from our driveways. But it's always uh, uh, you know beneficial in some ways too. <clears throat> Another challenge is using 
this latest greenhouse facility, which was uh, ju uh, just uh, constructed, I think five years ago, it replaced an older Lord and Burnham glass house that was built in 1971. And Fortunately, this new one gave us back a lot of uh, propagation space. The, the one before that um, had very little space. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, bench heat and misters and, well, you know, all kinds of bells and whistles, which um, allows us to do a lot more um, propagation than we were doing, at least um, prior to that. <clears throat> We used to, in that old house and in the ones before it, going back all the way to, I think, 1890 is when our first greenhouse was constructed. But we used to grow a ton of annuals, of bedding plants, and, you know, up to as much as 90,000 a year, uh, we're down to more like 20,000 and, and sinking quickly. And so we're trying to grow more things that we believe will be um, useful going forward, especially with things like transitioning away from, from mowed lawns. And in this case, you know, one question I have, of course, is how will it be perceived by the public when we're using an unconventional mix here? This is, you know, maybe not what you would find in nature in a wild area, uh, not that there are a lot of those left here around Boston, but um, you know, this is an this is an experiment using an unconventional mix, Coreopsis and Hypericum and uh, and, a, and a really attractive blue foliage sedge. So, and I think I said it earlier, but we've always been an unusual blend. Um, where horticulture and um, monumentation and uh, the built landscape uh, interacts, hopefully in a way that uh, you know creates a compelling uh, experience for the visitors, um, for our supporters, um, and you know balancing our efforts to accommodate all of the reasons this place has resonated with the public over so long. Uh, remains our primary objective. We are we are evolving as the public is, and as as uh, people become more educated about the ecological concerns of, of uh, you know in the modern, especially the urban world, um, we are doing our best to keep pace with those changes. And by the way. Um, Asa Gray, whose lot is pictured here, I hope you know who that is. He's considered the, the grandfather of, North, of American botany. He's notable for being the one who discovered the similarities between the disjunct plant species uh, found in Eastern Asia and Eastern North America and provided a, a, um, a very coherent explanation which evolved where plants evolved from common ancestors and were separated because of continental drift for millions of years. This was at the time Darwin was coming out with his theories on evolution and Asa Gray, who was a friend of his and a colleague, uh, gave him this, which was a sort of compelling explanation and it lent a lot of um, credence to Darwin's theories. So I'm going to leave it at that point. Um, and again, uh, welcome you. If you ever have the chance, I hope you will take advantage of that and come and visit us. Um, I, I know there was one question in the chat. Um, it was oh. it was it was more of a comment actually, Dennis. It was Tanya saying amazing Egyptomania entrance. Yes. <laughs> so it was more yeah. of a, a more of a comment. Um, but gosh, thank you so much, Dennis. Now, um, how many staff are looking after the 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 arboretum? Yes, well, horticulture staff is um, I think at the moment sixteen or seventeen full time year round. Right. And another 30 seasonal 
okay okay yeah yeah and i i know i can see over the back of your head that um that there's some plans on the wall that look a little bit um familiar so the the new the new plans oh. of <laughs> is that is this top yeah, secret so i know no no old blurt of that out before oh. oh it's top secret I was, top well so it hasn't been announced yet uh, right pete or Adolf had done uh some plans and I have to say, at least I'll tell you this much, it was a true pleasure working with him and with Tom DeWitt, mm -hmm. uh, some remarkable people. And we were lucky enough to get them interested in that. This was just as the pandemic was, uh, or just before it started. And, mm -hmm. uh, and Pete couldn't come over here much uh, during those early couple of first couple of years. But um, we we had to hit the pause button because we we have a transition we have a new administration and we're doing uh uh some vision planning in order to do um long-range strategic plans which haven't been done here since 1993 and like me those plans are getting a little long in the tooth as they say. <laughs> So it was time, and we're simply doing that uh, assessment to um, see how much we have, we'd like to do, and how soon. Oh, uh, right. Okay. So it's just a question of time, I think. Yeah, um, okay. Well, fair enough. So we, we, we won't tell anybody. <laughs> yes, um, uh, it's about and, and to... Yeah, do, do you have, I was, I'm looking at those wonderful images. What about deer and rabbits? And I know deer yes. are a big issue in the state. So, yes. Probably, yeah. So because we have had a fence around the property for oh. most of the 190 years, um, we have not had deer problems. Wow, until, okay. Until um, a, two years ago, when apparently two deer walked in the gate, <laughs> one of the gates, um we think they were a brother and sister they were young and they spent the entire summer devouring things that oh. no deer has had a chance to eat uh, as long as we've been here so yeah. they uh finally reached the point where uh, it, in the fall it was deer mating season right and they wanted to be outside we thought you know, we thought, okay, they're brother and sister, so they really need to kind of get out and, and start dating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we decided to leave the back gates open overnight for three or four nights. And it really after the second day, they had found it and they left. And oh, right. They Gosh. haven't been back. Right. But rabbits, on the other hand, um, torture us. Uh, yeah. They, you know, it's funny because we, we keep talking about all the wildlife habitat yeah <laughs> that we're doing yeah, yeah. and i feel like i can't then complain about the rabbit problem but yes mm -hmm. the rabbits what's what's frustrating is they keep changing their minds they they like this thing but then they decide no i i like that thing more so you can't <laughs> predict you try to you try to add things that you think they don't like and yeah. then you discover they like a lot more than you Something. yeah yeah oh that's frustrating that's now ulla has asked a question she's saying using natives do you rely on members of the same plant societies or do you mix um say that again well um well she goes on to say i've seen block planting of natives do you try to maintain that structure or do you blend within the time so oh, yeah you, yeah a, a little of both, but yeah. uh, I would say nowadays much more blending. Bl yeah. Block planting, you know, horticulturally works yeah. and uh, has been around longer, I think, although you could say that the, the mixed border has been around for more than a century, too. But yeah. um, for us, I think, uh, at least in the time I've been here and, and from what I learned about uh, the decades before that, uh, block planting was easier. It was, um, you know, somewhat effective, you, uh -huh. horticulturally, aesthetically, it it, um, it works on a lot of levels, and uh -huh. it's easier to maintain. Um, now, you know, the level of complexity can, can vary, of course, if you do a matrix planting with three things, it's almost, uh, um, 
feasible, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, something with 15 things might be a, a much diff more difficult task. But okay. um, yeah, it's all about the level of maintenance who are willing to give any particular planting. Right, right. And Dennis, from a historical point of view, um, I mean, it's it's relatively common in the US for large scale cemeteries to be arboretums and vice versa. That that's, doesn't really happen here. I mean, now we have new burial sites, but that's a sort of slightly different thing. Is it why do you think that is that 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 became more common in the States? Do you think it's a space issue or? I don't know if it was simply because um, the parks movement was inspired by those early, you know, what they considered at the time to be rural cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Simply they were outside of the city. Right. Or in the outskirts or something. But right. it was, in a way, the, because it was the public's first taste of horticulture, I don't know if that you know created a in a positive feedback loop and hmm. some of these cemeteries like Mount Arbor just continued although we were founded by the horticulture society within a few years we officially and formally parted ways but we have nevertheless pursued uh, horticulture at the highest level I think Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe many of these others like Greenwood Cemetery in New York City or Brooklyn Mm -hmm. um, and others at Laurel Hill in Philadelphia uh, yeah. were still doing that too. Yeah. And and to be honest, not every city has um, a, a good botanical garden in it, uh, at least you know close enough so that a lot of the residents can easily get to it and enjoy it. Yeah. So yeah. you know, in Boston, we've got the Arnold Arboretum on the other side of the city, which is a, you know I think a world class uh, destination. But all of the people who live on this side, the Cambridge side, um, you know, they think of this as their place to go and yeah. they don't spend a half hour or more trying to get over to the other side. Yeah, yeah. So and, course, and, and, and I mean, are there, I don't know how to, how to put this tactfully, are there lots still available? Is it still, are you still um, creating new grave sites within the Arboretum? Yes. Yeah. Um, and just as uh, you may, I don't know if you know, but of course, real estate prices in Cambridge are uh, through the roof. <laughs> there's a, there's, it's a sort of parallel little market. It, it, sure. if, you, if you wanted to, you could purchase a lot at Mount Arbor. Mm -hmm. It would probably be a lot more expensive than, or a bit more expensive than another cemetery further out in the suburbs. Right, right. Uh, yeah. but, but, but for what you get, I think, uh, it's still... Yeah. Uh, a compelling place that people mm. who come here, especially the ones mm. who visit all the time, and we get a lot of daily and weekly visitors, mm -hmm. they're just saying, of course, I want to be here. I don't want to be anywhere else. And yeah, yeah. so that they, they do, they find ways to uh, locate a spot in the old section. And yeah, we're doing all kinds of it. If, if you do cremation burials, that will never run out of space. Of course, yeah. They don't require yeah. much. Um, yeah. We only want to maybe carefully manage the types and numbers of monuments that come into the landscape. Right, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, fascinating. Well, listen, Dennis, it's been it's been wonderful to sort of have a little journey over to um, to Massachusetts for for an hour or so. It's been really lovely and definitely is on my list. And um, I hope to come up and and hopefully next year we'll get the chance to come out and see you. But it's been absolutely fascinating. And um, you know, the various people have just said to me recently how amazing Mount Auburn is, and 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 you've proved it. It it just looks incredible. So. Congratulations on such a wonderful, creating such a wonderful environment and um, and such a beautiful place. So, yeah, it's been it's been great hearing about it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Lovely. OK. And, um, and yeah. OK, well, well, we'll say cheerio, but thank you very much and hope to see you maybe um, in the future. Definitely. OK, thanks, Dennis. Everyone. All the very best. Bye bye. Bye bye.